notice that when we look at countries today, they're very different even though they're proximate. Take, for example, Mexico and the United States, or for that matter, Mexico and Canada. Or why is Bolivia and Peru uh, far more impoverished than our North American nation? Or why is New Zealand and Australia so different than Indonesia? There has to be a reason after all. One of the most obvious explanations is that they were former members of the British Commonwealth and at one time British colonies in a way that Spanish-speaking South America was part of Spain or other countries were part of France, but they don't seem to be as successful today. Now, of course, British colonies were envisioned very differently than Spanish colonies. Anybody could really come and settle and prosper. North America was originally a British colony, but there were Dutch, there were Germans, there were French people, there were people from all over Europe that could settle, unlike Spain, where only Spanish speakers were permission from the crown and very few families came as religious Protestant pilgrims, for example. That was one explanation, but it's not the real explanation. The real explanation is why did Britain have such a tolerant liberal policy and Spain or France did not? You could make the argument, as an American, it's sometimes difficult to make the argument, but you could make the argument that the grievances of the founding fathers vis-a-vis -vis those later of San Martin or Bolivar in South America were very minor. They were over contractual disputes, freedom to set taxes, freedom and representation to set local governments and not to be ruled by a distant but more or less liberal monarch whose power was checked by a parliament in a way that was not true to the same degree of France and Germany and Italy and other European countries. So there was a liberalism in Europe. And that's very important to understand this concept of American exceptionalism. Because as Americans, we try to trace our ancestry to the classical tradition. We know that democracy and republican government and free markets, religious tolerance, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, all of these come through a long process uh, from Greece to Rome to the medieval period to the Renaissance, the Reformation, Central Europe, and to the United States. And so we share that with Quebec, and we share that in some extent with a Cuba or Mexico. But we're exceptional because our particular Western heritage has this English, British, United Kingdom flavor to it, which has given us enormous advantages, enormous advantage. Before we talk about those advantages, what was so unique about Britain? After all, it was Christianized about the same time as were other northern European tribal areas. It had a series of monarchies like mainland Europe. And the answer, I think, is partly due to geography. England was close to Europe, some 30 miles or 40 miles in key places from the French coast, but it was separate. In fact, it was only invaded three times, once by Caesar, once by Claudius, and once in 1066 by William the Conqueror, and then nobody else could do it. Napoleon couldn't do it, Hitler couldn't do it. Geography and isolation meant that Britain enjoyed the cross currents from European civilization, but it could develop in its own protected way. It had a pretty good climate. It had temperate weather, it was, had very little snowfall, there's very few mountains in England, most of the land is arable. It had coal later in the Industrial Revolution. It was located with an entire coast facing both Europe, but also southward, along the French coast into the Mediterranean. And of course, it had an advantage because it was the most westward of all European nations and had a window on the New World when it was discovered. So it was a seafaring power. All of that isolation and the advantages of a rich natural climate helped, but there was also a tradition in Britain very early of solving problems through consensus, through civility, through moderation and compromise. That didn't mean that they were not going to kill a king. After all, Charles was executed uh, 150 years, in fact, before Louis was in France. That didn't mean that they would not have a reformation. We hear about Oliver Cromwell for some 20 years overthrowing the monarchy and uh, creating the new model army and creating a parliamentary Protestant rule, so to speak, as if it were going to be the future of England. It, it, it was not. but. They did have revolutions, they did have reformations, they did have coups. But the point of all this is to, not to the same degree that Europe did. Take the Reformation. The Reformation in England did not lead to a bloody 30 years war. It led to coups, but it was primarily instigated by Henry VIII over a dynastic question of succession. And 
people became Protestant and they fought with Catholics, but they did not have full-fledged wars. It was not a mass movement uh, to exterminate Catholics or vice versa that had been true uh, in Europe. Take revolution. The Magna Carta was 1215 when barons forced King John to grant some limited power. Within a century, there was a rudimentary parliamentary system. And the history of Britain from about 1300 to 1900 is a gradual, gradual extension in the power of parliament to check the monarchy and the monarchy to become more an executive, even though it was passed on by dynastic succession. But you see these long reigns of Elizabeth or Victoria or King George, where you have a sense of stability. And there had been very early in the English experience this idea that we must negotiate with Parliament, with a monarch. We must negotiate with Scotland. We must negotiate with Ireland, with Wales. Didn't mean there were bloody wars. But gradually, over the centuries, the British developed a system of stability and compromise and negotiation that led to a very stable a political system. And because it was isolated and because it had natural resources and because of its geographical uh, stance uh, toward the New World, it was uniquely positioned to take advantage of the discovery of the New World and the modern Industrial Revolution. So we should remember a couple of things, that the great exploration that followed the Spanish discoveries were largely British and the settlement were largely British. And the great constitutional changes in European society were mostly British. And if we look at the Enlightenment, that great period, oh, say, from 1700 to 1830 or 40 in Northern Europe, the ability to look at problems without resorting to religion or superstition, to say, you know, we're going to use an inductive method, we're going to be empirical, we're going to be scientific. If you look at the British tradition of the Enlightenment, John Locke, Jeremy Bentham, David Hume, it was much, much different than Voltaire or Rousseau, much more grounded in practicality, much more moderate, much less theoretical and abstract. So there's not going to be a French Revolution at the same period in England that there is in France. There's not going to be revolutions of 1848 sweeping Britain as they do in Europe. And that stability created a sense of the rule of law, of contractual law. Britain is a nation where contracts matter and property rights matter. That heritage was brought to the United States in a way that was not brought to Quebec and it was not brought to Indonesia and it was not brought to the same degree to parts of Latin America. A second thing to remember is the language, of course. The United States was founded by British settlers essentially at the height of British power. So for most of the 18th century, People were leaving a superpower with a great navy and a language that was starting to be the commercial language of the world. So we inherited a language that soon was to displace the scientific vocabulary of Germany and the diplomatic vocabulary of France, and along with Canada and Australia and New Zealand and uh, Britain, we were the inheritors of a very rich language. And I mean that rich in, in a philological sense as well. English has an enormous vocabulary. Like German, it's able to build a lot of compound. It's not highly inflected like French, but especially Spanish or Italian. It's a unique language, a mixture of native Anglo-Saxon uh, vocabulary supplanted by influences from Germany, but also from Norman French, and of course the classical uh, contributions of Latin. And the result is it's a very rich language that creates new words and compounds and ideas very effectively and precisely. So if you want to come up with an idea like a payroll savings plan or you want to say a anti-virus software, try to translate that in Fr into French versus English. English, it's a very, very uh, practical language. And because we inherited after World War II the uh, British Empire, the result is that today, English is the third most spoken language after Mandarin, Chinese, and Spanish. But more importantly, it's the largest language of second speakers. In other words, more people in the world speak a second language that is English than any other second language. And, and this is a key statistic, the people who were born speaking English and who speak it now are not as numerous as the people who acquired English. And English is now the scientific, the diplomatic, the political language of the world, another legacy from Britain. So when we try to look at 
the United States' uh, multifarious cultural traditions. Of course, we have a classical president. Of course, we have a European president. Of course, we are enriched by immigrants from Asia, from Africa, from South America. But along the classical and European uh, imprints on American society is this notion of Britain and England and the United Kingdom. Now, how do we notice that every day? Well, as I said, we notice it in our speech. We notice it in the American ability to compromise. It didn't mean we, didn't, we wouldn't have a civil war. We didn't have labor unrest. But generally, as we look at the world today, the United States is not rioting to the same degree they are in Athens. If a foreigner comes to the United States, there's a greater likelihood that he will not be subject to an airline strike, a taxi strike, a train strike, as he would if he were in France, or if he were in Greece, or if he were in Italy. There's a system that we inherited from the British that life should be one of negotiation. If you are ill, and I remember having a ruptured appendix in Libya. When I left Libya, which is a very rich country, it has 50 billion barrels of known oil reserves. This is during the reign of Gaddafi. I went straight to Britain. Why? Because I could assume that when I got to Britain and I was ill, there would be a hotel, there would be a just and caring system to rest, there would be an airport that was clean and functional, and then I could fly to the United States where it would be the same. Doesn't mean it wasn't true in parts of Germany, but remember, you could do this in England in 1939 and 1940 and 1941. You could do it in England in 1914 and 1915. You can do it in England in 1871. That was not true of Germany, and it wasn't true of some of its rivals on the European continent. 19th century Britain was the most enlightened, free place in the world if you were a citizen and, and you pursued the life of the mind. So we as Americans uh, inherited this unique language that had a head start on other languages and was intrinsically a rich, fertile language for scientific and political parlance. We inherited a tradition for ironing out differences through negotiation. We also inherited, inherited an idea of parliamentary government. Now, we didn't adopt the parliamentary system, but as you know from the Federalist Papers, the Founding Fathers were enormously influenced through it. And they tried to find a stable political system without one factor of stability, a monarch, a consul, a Spartan king, so to speak, that had been integral to the political process throughout Western civilization. Western politics had always been, how do we mitigate or modify or nuance the power of a monarch so that it would be constitutional and consensual without overthrowing them. And Britain solved that problem and still has solved it to this day. We in America did not want to follow that pattern, but we wanted to, to get the stability, so we came up with this tripartite system, in part influenced by the French and British Enlightenments. So we inherited the idea of compromise, contractual, a negotiation, civility, a language. There was another idea as well, and, and Again, it's controversial, but as I said at the beginning, Britain is 60% Protestant. When the Reformation was causing mayhem and disruption and a counter-Reformation, this process of challenge and response uh, in the middle of Europe would go on for 150, 200 years. It was less so in England. And the transition to a Protestant country was much less violent, and the resulting culture that emerged was much more conducive to commerce and business. And so an Englishman in 1700 could go all over the world, from India to China to the New World, and he would engage in a contractual agreement about his insurance, about the leasing of a ship, about the interest charged on a loan, about a payment for a bill of goods, and people who did business with an Englishman could assume that his culture and his government reaffirmed his word, and that allowed commerce to prosper. And that was very important to American business in the uh, early 19th century, that legacy. So we were the direct inheritors of that as well. We came as settlers to own land and to protect property. I, I wish I could tell you that the emphasis of the founding tenets of the Constitution was absolute personal freedom, but it wasn't. If you look at the articles of the U.S. Constitution, and if you look at the Bill of Rights, they are to protect personal liberty, but more and even importantly, it's how to check the abuse of power and how to protect people's property and the right to pursue happiness in a way that's civilized and congeal and, and comfortable. That came from the notion that in Britain, 
people could own property and they would be protected, that a person's house was as much a sanctuary as a king's palace. And even though there was a class system in Britain, every British subject had a right to own property. And here's the key, and have it recorded and passed on to his heir. So if you go to Latin America today, if you go to parts of the Caribbean today that are not English, there's a greater likelihood that if you buy a piece of property, you're not going to have a title search. You're not sure who quite owns it. You're not sure when it can be expropriated by the government. But the English tradition of law protects property, and it's essential to business. That, too, was something in America we inherited and enhanced. All of this raises another question, though, and some of us Americans would not like to pose it. That is, if the British tradition was so unique and dynamic, then why did we reject it and have a revolution? Because we were, after all, rebelling against King George. We weren't rebelling against the, an abstract system that we had benefited so much from. And more importantly, when we look around the world today, is Canada such an awful place to live in? Is Australia such an awful place to live in? Is New Zealand such an awful place to live in? We think that um, they're left-wing or socialist and we're a free market enterprise. They think today that we're becoming socialistic and they are liberalizing. So there's a sense of stability that they were not as far right as we are and now they're not as far left as we are. So what was so unique about the British system? And why do we reject it? And the answer to that is the Americans uh, erred on the side of personal freedom, individualism, and they cut off their traditions with the British crown in reaction to their infringement on taxation, taxation without representation. And the result was that the United States, unlike Canada and unlike Australia and unlike New Zealand, it said, we have no affiliation with Britain. We are Americans. We're starting over new. We're a city on the hill. We've taken the British system, but we did a great thing by eliminating a monarchy and, more importantly, the close and careful distinction between the classes. We don't believe there's any such thing as peasants or manors or lords. We got out of our vocabulary earl and baron or Dame Edith or Lord Wilson. All of that vanished, vanished. And we in America said, we'll take people from any part of the world and they're going to be united by one thing, a common popular culture and adherence to this free Bill of Rights and this wonderful Constitution. And the result is that Today, when you look at an Englishman or an Australian or a Canadian or a New Zealand, they're pretty much going to look alike. Their accent, it's going to sound alike, and they're going to have the same polite manners, so to speak. And the governments of Canada and Australia and New Zealand are not going to be that different from Britain, the United Kingdom. That's not true in the United States. You don't know what an American looks like. You don't know necessarily how he's going to sound. Uh, and somehow, because of the genius of our founding fathers, we were able to create a uniform, coherent system that not only was based on the British model, but transcended it. What is the future going to be like? Well, if you say that a stable parliamentary system with a monarch and respect for property rights and a glorious tradition of religious moderation is still not enough for you, and you're going to reject that because you want to be even more dynamic or more equal are more diverse, then you've taken upon yourself to say that this experiment will work. We do not need British stability. We do not need British civility. We do not need the British class structure. We do not need the titular monarchy anymore. We are Americans, and we can be reckless and self-indulgent if we want. And the question is, we're, we in the 21st century are now looking at this great exper experiment very carefully because we seem to be in periods of crisis in a way that the former British Commonwealth is not. And it's incumbent upon Americans to realize their past, that we were enriched by the British tradition, that we made a gamble by severing it for the greater advantages of personal freedom and a multiracial, multicultural society. But in doing that, we also took a greater risk because we severed our ties with a system that had enriched the world and continues to enrich the world today.